So in the last video, we saw the definition of a low distortion embedding. In this one, we'll see Borghain's embedding, which is a central result in the theory of metric embeddings. Relevant for us, it's also a nice example of a randomized algorithm. So the theorem that we're going to prove is the following. Given any finite metric space, xd, where x has n points in it, there exists an embedding of xd into rkd1 with the following properties. First, the target dimension k is going to be big O of log squared n. And second, the distortion of the embedding, so that is how much it messes up distances, is going to be big O of log n. So here recall that d1 refers to the l1 distance. In fact, this embedding actually works into LP spaces for any p greater than or equal to 1, not just for l1. We might see this in class and or on homework. As a side note, it's actually possible to improve the target dimension k to big O of log n, but it's not possible to improve the distortion. There are some metrics that require big omega of log n distortion, no matter what the target dimension. OK, so here's the embedding. I'm going to go through it first in words, and then I'll draw a picture. So the embedding is randomized, which is why we're talking about it in randomized algorithms class. And the way it works is as follows. So first, for i, that goes from 1 to log n, and then for j that goes from 1 to c log n, I'm going to choose a set, s sub i j, a subset of my space x, at random, so that for every little x in big X, that little x is contained in the set s i j independently with probability 2 to the minus i. And then I'm going to define my embedding as follows. So the image f of x of x under this embedding is just going to be this vector. So this is a vector where I've taken the distances between x and sij for all of the sij's, and I've just shoved them together in a vector. So here, when I say the distance between x and a set, what I mean is that the distance between x and the sum set s is defined to be equal to the minimum over y in s of the distance between x and y. So I'll draw a picture of what's going on here in a moment, but the form of this might look familiar. It's similar to the embedding into L infinity that we saw in the previous video. In that embedding, we just mapped x to a vector that was the distance between x and all of the other points in the space. The difference here is that instead of looking at the distance to single points, we're looking at the distance to sets, and instead of looking at all of the sets, we're looking at some random collection of sets. So here's a picture of what this embedding is doing. So suppose that this is our space x, and we have some points, little x, that we'd like to embed. So the first thing we're going to do, this is for i equals 1 and j equals 1, is I'm going to choose a subset of x at random, including every point with probability a half. So I'm going to choose like a pretty dense random subset. So here it is. OK, that's a random subset. Then I'm going to find the closest point in this subset to x. Let's say it's this one here. Then I'm going to take this distance, which is d of x and s11, and write that as the first coordinate in my vector. Now I'm going to forget that I've done all of that and do it again. So I'm going to pick another random set where each point is included with probability 1 half. So let's say that this one looks like this. Then once again, I'm going to find the closest point to x in this set. Let's say it's this one. So then I'm going to take this distance, which is d of x s1, 2. And I'm going to write that as the second coordinate in my embedding. And now I'm going to erase what I just did. This is fun. And do it all again. After I've done this c times log n times, so I've exhausted over all of the possible j's, I'm then going to switch i. So now when i equals 2, I'm going to pick another random set, but now it's going to be a little bit less dense. Now instead of including every point with probability a half, I'm going to include every point with probability a fourth. So my new set will look like some sparser random set. And once again, I find the closest point to x in this set. Maybe this is the distance between x and 
S21. And then I'll write that as some coordinate that lives in this dot dot dots here. And then erase that and continue on. At the end of the day, we're going to be choosing points to include with probability 2 to the minus log n, also known as 1 over n. So that means when I get to the final round of random sets, I expect there to be only one point in the set. And then the distance between x and that point is going to be what's written in these coordinates here. OK, so hopefully the definition of the embedding makes sense. But why is this a good idea? Let's see some intuition. So let's consider this map f of x, which just returns the distance between x and the set s. So this map has a nice property in that it is non-expanding. So by that, I mean the distance between f of x and f of y, which are just real numbers, so I just mean the absolute value of their difference, is no more than the distance between x and y in the original space. So why is this the case? To see this, consider the setup shown here. And let's imagine that z is the closest point in x to s. So that means that the distance between x and s is equal to the distance between x and z. Further, since z is in s, we can look at this distance from z to y and say that the distance from y to s is less than or equal to the distance from y to z. Using this notation, we can write f of y minus f of x. So by definition, this is the distance between y and s minus the distance between x and s. And this is less than or equal to the distance between y and z minus the distance between x and z. But then by the triangle inequality, this is less than or equal to the distance between x and y. So I could have done the same calculation switching the roles of x and y, and I would have figured out that f of x minus f of y is also less than or equal to the distance between x and y. So that allows me to put some absolute values here. And that proves the statement. OK, so now that we know that f is not expanding in this sense, then to show that this embedding works, sort of intuitively, we need to show that it's also, at least probably, not too shrinking, meaning that f of x minus f of y is bigger than or equal to some appropriate delta. If this is true sort of most of the time for enough of the s's for appropriate values of delta, then a decent number of coordinates of this embedding are going to be contributing something that's pretty close to the actual distance. And that will mean that the embedding has low distortion. So intuitively, what we want to show is that this map f, at least for a random s, is probably not too shrinking. So this leads us to the question, when is that map not too shrinking? Well, suppose that the situation looks like this. So here we have our points x and y. And I'm going to draw a closed ball of radius delta around x. So this here is the ball of z in capital X such that the distance between z and x is less than or equal to delta. And here I'm going to draw an open ball around y of radius delta plus capital delta. So this here is the set z in capital X, such that the distance between z and y is strictly less than little delta plus big delta. Don't worry too much about the distinction between closed and open for now. It won't actually make any difference for this intuition. We'll see the reason for it when we do the proof later. Just a note, I'm drawing this picture as though I were using the L2 metric, these balls around here. But that's just as a visual aid. Here, these should be interpreted as being in the metric D. So now, suppose that the set S looks like this relative to these two balls around x and y. In particular, suppose that this intersection here is non-empty, but that S and the ball around y are disjoint. So if this is the case, then the distance between y and s minus the distance between x and s is going to be at least, OK, so the distance between y and s, so that's at least little delta plus big delta, because s does not intersect this ball. 
So that's at least little delta plus big delta minus. Okay, so the distance between little x and s, well, that's going to be at most delta because there is some point in s that lives in the ball of radius delta around x. So minus delta. So this is just equal to big delta. So that means that if it just so happens that s looks like this with respect to these balls around x and y, then we get this not too shrinking property that we were after. Let's return to the question of why should this embedding work? Why is this a good idea? So what we just saw is that for each of these coordinates, if the set Sij happens to end up looking like this, then that coordinate is doing a good job. We know it's not expanding with respect to the original metric. And if this situation happens, we just argued that it's not too shrinking. And not expanding plus not too shrinking means pretty good for a low distortion embedding. So our strategy is going to be as follows. For each fixed i, we're going to pick a lot of random s's and hope that this good situation happens enough of the time. So that's what this loop over j is doing. However, intuitively, this good situation is only going to happen if s has kind of the right density relative to the number of points in each of these balls. So we're going to try lots of different densities for s, and that's what this loop over i is doing. Okay, so that's the intuition. In the next video, we're going to make this intuition formal and actually prove that this embedding is a good idea. So see you there.